Okay. So I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for everything that you've done, all the effort that you've put into the nutrition program. This phase for us is just the start. So we want to follow up with you guys and keep going. And anytime you have any any questions for us, let us know. Um, we are we're happy to help. From my perspective, is you guys keep us all safe. The least that we can do is help you guys stay healthy. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, so I also want to acknowledge the students who put a ton of work into all of this um, and in everything else that they do. Uh, but um, and then down the bottom, why is my name black? Did you do that, Palola? Did you do that somehow? <laughs> right? Huh. Took my eye off it for one second. Uh, so that's us. Oh, you're mad because I took away your master's degree. I don't have it on there. That's why you did that. Yeah, got it. Here's what we do. Specific aims of this part of the project. To develop a comprehensive nutritional and conditioning program that optimizes your health and performance, physical activity, and anything that you do, uh, we want to try to make that easier for you. Then what we're going to do is over time, we're going to quantitate changes in your health, the, your nutrition knowledge, and that includes stuff like this that we learn that can help you in applications, but also like the cooking lessons and any of that other nutritional information, all of that kind of goes together and we'll be assessing that as we go. We want to make this program the best that we can, and this is initial phase, so we'll take all this information and then try to improve it as we go, so that's why we're getting data along the way. Um, we'll look at changes in body composition. You guys all have your DEXA printouts. We'll do that again in a few months to run through that, and then also your physical measurements, and um, Captain Windsor and everyone is also, of course, assessing your physical performance, so it kind of all goes together. We're going to consistently assess and adjust dietary intake to improve performance, body composition, overall health. Kind of in the background, the nutrition students have been working on personalized menu plans for you. So you'll get those either before you leave or they'll be emailed to you right away. You'll start off with a simple menu plan and then that will be um, added to as we go so that you have lots of different options for each meal that are all meet your nutritional recommendations. So specific goals of the nutrition plan. Providing fuel to the exercising muscles. Okay. Enhance recovery from your exercise. So replenishing energy stores and also repairing tissues so that you can adapt to the physical uh, stresses. Cons we're going to have you consume a nutrient-dense diet. Avoid micronutrient and electrolyte deficiencies. Sustain optimal hydration status. I'll talk about that some today. We're going to try to avoid alcohol consumption. Provide nutritional information for short and long-term performance and health benefits. Can you, can you avoid? Oh, what's that? Avoid? Um. <laughs> <laughs> we discussed the red wine. Remember last week, did we say? Yes. Or red wine. And you guys can find it at where? There's a short circuit here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so reasonable would be, you know, any time, it's probably, I'd say, one or two times a week, and each of those times is maybe one or two glasses. Yeah, and of course that has calories. So that all has to be incorporated into that. And those are empty calories, right? So that's what, you know, what we call discretionary. Um, so that's kind of um, part of it. And um, amazingly enough, athletes in our programs have not consumed any alcoholic beverages for about three years now. Wink, wink. Um, but we can kind of tell those that... Are, are consuming alcoholic beverages, it has an effect. Um, so everything kind of needs to be in moderation, especially something like that, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the important things of this is, you know, where do you get your fuel during exercise? So there tends to be four different uh, energy compartments that we're gonna talk about. Fuel sources <laughs> for muscle, for ATP generation. Have you heard that term before? ATP, that's a little molecule inside your cells that can actually be broken apart and provide energy for those cells, including muscle cells, to do work. 
like functional movement. So that's what our metabolism is basically for. It's one of the reasons is we get ATP production. Now, fat is a fuel source. Fat derived from blood transport from fat cells or intramuscular stores. So during certain types of exercise, you can use fat to get ATP. However, oxygen and electron transport chain in mitochondria are required, which means if you're doing something high intensity and you are not able to provide adequate amounts of oxygen to the exercising muscle, you cannot burn fat. Okay? It means if you're walking across the, the camp or, or base and you're doing low intensity exercise like that, most of your energy is going to come from fat. As soon as you start jogging or sprinting or doing anything like that, the amount of energy that you get from fat declines. The amount of energy that you have to get from carbohydrate goes up. Okay? And we'll talk more about that in a second. Carbohydrates, the source can be either liver or muscle glycogen stores. Carbohydrates, the most versatile energy source because it can be energy source during anaerobic or aerobic energy. Right? We know anaerobic means without oxygen. So that means high intensity exercise. It's hard to provide enough oxygen, so it becomes an anaerobic scenario. For the aerobic, that's the low intensity exercise when your cardiovascular system can provide oxygen to all of the exercising tissues or muscles. We say that's aerobic conditions. Okay? Carbohydrates are required for high intensity exercise. And one of the issues is storage is often the limiting factor. It's hard to store enough carbohydrate to sustain long periods of high intensity exercise. Protein, normally a minimal source of energy, it's more important for muscle maintenance and recovery. And there's also creatine phosphate. How I many of you guys have heard of creatine? Okay. It's a very common supplement. Our body actually makes creatine. Our body makes significant amounts of creatine. Creatine supplementation can be helpful depending on the scenario. And if you guys have any questions about that, let us know. We can talk about that. Um, it can help in certain scenarios, but one of the things that creatine does is it basically allows water and attracts water into muscle fibers. So it's important that you remain well hydrated. It's important that you, I would say, stay off of creatine as long as you are on it. So you want to be off it for longer periods of time than you're on it, and you'd kind of want to cycle on and off. It'll also make you gain, it tend to make you gain weight. If I started a creatine regimen today, probably within the next couple weeks, I'd gain at least five pounds because of the water accumulation. Is that so, fat gain or muscle gain? Initially, it's water. It's a change in hydration. Now, if I stayed on that and that helped improve my workouts and I was able to do more high intensity work, and because of that, I added more muscle tissue, now when I get off the creatine, the weight that I lose, I'll lose the water weight, but I may be able to maintain some of that muscle that I've accumulated. So it has to be paired with a good diet and a good exercise program. Just by taking it and not making the other changes, it's not going to be effective. Now, the creatine phosphate system is only has enough ATP to last about 5 to 10 seconds. And that's it. So it's the high intensity stuff, and then it's gone. Okay. So for most exercise applications, creatine phosphate is gone pretty quickly. So we have to rely on other sources. So we're getting towards your handouts now on those calculations. But here's a good example, I think. Um, this has to do with what type of energy do you use during different types of exercise? If we look at the key, any place you see green on these bars, the energy is coming from protein. Yellow is carbohydrate and orange, is that red or orange? Red, red is fat. <laughs> Passion fruit is fat. Okay? So if we look, for example, weightlifting, it's sometimes surprising to people. You actually burn more fat during a typical weightlifting exercise than you do carbohydrate or protein. A lot of people consume a lot of protein if they lift weights because they think you need that during the weightlifting session. You actually don't. Why is it so much fat? It's in between, so you're doing high intensity, but you're typically resting. You're resting in between sets or exercises, and while you're resting, what are you doing? You're replenishing those muscle fibers with oxygen. That allows you to burn fat. When you're actually doing the movement, it's either creatine phosphate or carbohydrate. Okay? 
but overall it helps burn fat that way. And here we have uh, 200 meter hurdles, which is not an event. This is just part of the slide. Um, higher intensity, so look at the change in fuel. It's mostly almost all carbohydrate, right? Higher intensity overall compared to that. Here's this basketball player. I think it's not just a, a random number here, number 23. Uh, carbohydrate in that. I want to say championship basketball. That's a lot different than the basketball I play. <laughs> it's sloppy YMCA type basketball, so mine would be different from that. Hard cycling for one hour, right? Quite a bit of carbohydrate. But in the higher intensity stuff, it's hard to go for um, really high intensity for very long, so it's kind of moderate intensity, and that allows you to burn some fat. And a two-hour marathon, most of the energy is going to come from, it's kind of, in that case, it's kind of equal. But one of the things to notice is protein's gone up. If a person's a well-trained endurance athlete, it gives them the ability to get a little bit more energy from amino acids. Okay, but overall, you can see protein's a very minimal energy source. So what are some of the things that allows us to improve exercise performance? Factors affecting carbohydrate use during exercise. So what do we have to depend on? Well, duration of the exercise is a key component because if it's a long period of time, we're probably going to have to utilize some fat to sustain that. The intensity of the exercise we talked about. Here's a really important pre-exercise carbohydrate store status. We have to store that carbohydrate before the exercise starts. Carbohydrate intake during exercise can help us go longer, but it's not enough. Degree of training, your muscles get better at storing carbohydrate. The more times that you deplete and add carbohydrate to them, they get better at it. And sometimes it'll double the amount of carbohydrate that you can actually store. Okay? Pre-exercise foods can help. Like if they have carbohydrates in there and your blood glucose goes, is starting to go up, that's when you want to start exercising. And the type of exercise, it depends on kind of the actual type of exercise. Now you guys, we've mentioned this a couple times, and you've seen this structure before. So glycogen, remember, is glucose in storage form. And the molecular structures here, if you take a step back and look in a little bit less detail, it shows like this. Each one of these circles is a glucose molecule. There's two reasons glycogen is like that. By making all of these branches in the structure, it allows more glucose to be stored in a certain area of a tissue. It also allows that glucose to be released very quickly. Every place that you see this filled in circle, that's a, a site where the enzyme can actually bind and, relieve gluco and release glucose. So you can go through glycogen very quickly because of that. And in some scenarios, that's advantageous, especially until you run out. And if you look at this actual under a light microscope, you can see what are called glycogen crystals in cells. And, and you can see before and after exercise, they'll disappear. So glycogen is in liver and muscle cells. More on that in a second. So we, it's broken down glucose when needed. Liver glycogen helps maintain blood glucose. But muscle glycogen is not released into the, into the blood. And it's used for energy in the muscle cell that stored it, and that's it. So it's important that we store adequate amounts. This is a, a, a classic study that was done a few years ago in, in sports nutrition. And this has to do with the numbers that you just calculated. Right? The point of all of this is during certain types of exercise intensity, certain types of fuels have to be used. One way to predict that is to measure your heart rates. And that's the simplest way to do this. So if we look here, VO2 max, have you heard that term? What does VO2 max mean? Have you ever heard anybody say, oh, what's your VO2 max? Or have you done VO2 max testing or anything like that? Like in certain mm -hmm. events, you, you have to do so that. Yep. The amount of oxygen that you take in that you can actually be used, that your body actually uses for you. Nice. Yeah. That's spot on. The volume of oxygen. So O2 is oxygen. And it's a VO2 max, so it's the maximum amount or the maximum volume of oxygen that you can utilize, in this case, during exercise. 
right? So it's typically measured in either milliliters of oxygen or liters of oxygen. And as a person gets in better cardiovascular conditioning, in general, their VO2 max goes up. That's one of the advantages of training. Your VO2 max gets higher. Why? Because you have heart adaptations called cardiac hypertrophy. The left side of your heart, your left ventricle enlarges to allow your heart to distribute more blood and oxygen to tissues. You get more capillarization. You get more mitochondria and muscle fibers. There's a lot, your plasma or your blood volume goes up. All of that is meant to deliver more oxygen to your exercising muscles, okay? But that's a personalized number, a person's VO2 max. So 25% VO2 max is a low intensity type. Maybe that's about a fast walk. So your heart rate's gone up some, but not much. 65% VO2 max, I'll tell you why. That is, that's a good number for you to know. And 85% VO2 max is close to your maximum exercise intensity. So in other words, you could do these forever, pretty much. VO2 max depends on some issues, some some. Uh, criteria, 85% VO2 max, you wouldn't be able to sustain that for very long. That's high, relatively high intensity. If you get 100% or when you're doing a VO2 max test, you're way above 100% VO2 max for part of it. Um, but let's look at the top part. Muscle glycogen, we know what that is. So basically that is muscle glucose. Muscle triglyceride is your muscle fibers can store a little bit of fat and use it for energy. Plasma-free fatty acids, and we talked about triglyceride structure, and we said it has fatty acids that are part of the triglyceride. Well, when I start exercising, any place that I've stored triglyceride, like let's say, for example, around my stomach, those triglycerides can be broken apart, and those fatty acids go into the blood. So let's say I'm doing a stationary bike exercise. As I'm exercising, I'm breaking down body fat here, and the fat's going into the muscle fibers in my legs so that it can be used for energy. So when you exercise, those fatty acids tend to go up in the blood. Plasma glucose is, is just blood glucose. That's what it is. Now let's look at this. Over here we have, uh, with this bar, or say dumbbell, uh, or this barbell, has blood energy resources here. And in other words, these are sources of energy from the blood. These are sources of energy in the muscle. So now let's put, look at this. This is fuel sources during a 30-minute cycling event at different intensities. This is a fasting state. So it's not right after breakfast. 25% VO2 max. What's the major energy source? Yeah, plasma-free fatty acids. Basically, those fatty acids that have been mobilized have moved through the blood and are now being used to support energy production. A little bit of muscle triglyceride is used and some glucose from the blood. Now, let's say we're now exercising at 65% VO2 max. You guys have that number. So if you look at the number that you calculated, what are some of your numbers? 140 something? 145. 156. So right around those numbers, if you're exercising and you do your heart rate, and I would suggest get a heart rate monitor, you know, even a, a Fitbit or a Garmin or any of those, or take it on your wrist. Get that heart rate, and you can see if you're at those numbers, 65% VO2 max, where are you getting your fuel? Look at the big change here. Initially, at 25% VO2 max, we can get enough energy from the blood. But as soon as exercise intensity goes up, look what happens. We're still getting some glucose from the blood for energy. We're using some fat, but now what have we really tapped into? Some more triglycerides, but now it's in the muscle. And carbohydrate in muscle. It's now a very important energy source. Why? Oxygen is becoming limiting. That's one of the reasons. It's one of the reasons. Now look, now I go to the next level. You guys have another number. You have that 85% VO2 max. What numbers do you have there? 179, 69, 173. So right around that ballpark, you're at 85% VO2 max if your heart rate's there. Now look what happens. Look at the big change. Muscle glycogen. It's now a major energy source. Okay? 
As exercise intensity goes up, your reliance on carbohydrate goes up. As exercise intensity goes up, your reliance on muscle energy sources goes up. When did it get there? When did you store that glycogen? Before that workout. You have to do it before that workout. If you didn't, look what happens. Let's say you're exercising at 85% VO2 max and all your muscle glycogen is, is gone. What do you do? burn out, you, you slow down. You have to, because your energy source is gone. Why do you slow down? What energy source are you going to be using now? Fat. fat. Got to have oxygen to burn fat. So what do you do? You have to slow down to the level of exercise intensity that you can deliver oxygen adequately. You ever heard that term bonking or hitting the wall or any of that? That's basically what that represents. And you'll see it in cyclists and runners and skiers and whoever that's doing this, cross-country skiers. When they run out of muscle glycogen, they slow down. Other people pass them up. Okay? If that happens, some ways to avoid, try to avoid that is you're taking in carbohydrate during the high-intensity exercise. These guys are fasting. They're not doing that. So if you're doing higher intensity exercise, it's okay to drink some carbohydrate. We want to try to sustain your intense workouts. Because look at this. At low intensity exercise, are you burning more fat or carbohydrate? Low intensity is fat. Okay. Okay, we can say burning more fat, percentage wise. So if somebody says, oh, I want to burn fat, what should I do, just walk around the mall or it's a low intensity exercise, I'm going to burn fat. Look how many calories you're burning. These are calories per kilogram per minute, body weight per minute, less than 100. Most of it is coming from fat. Now look over here. More than about three times that with the high intensity exercise. So if you want to burn a lot of calories, high intensity exercise is a lot more effective at that. Are you burning any fat here? You're burning some. Yep. So which exercise is best? I'm going to say both. You want to do low intensity so that you stimulate and, and your body's ability to burn fat through some of the adaptation that I said, but you also want to do high intensity. So you want to, I'd say, mix. If time is limited for you, try to do the higher intensity exercise. And overall, that burns more calories. Yeah. If you can incorporate all of that, including like resistance training to add muscle and all of that, that's the best strategy overall. Okay? <laughs> now, I'll tell you why some of this stuff happens. I'll try to. Glycogen depletion. If you look at this, let's say, for example, this high intensity exercise quickly depletes glycogen. So if we have muscle glycogen, in other words, if we took a piece of your muscle or we use muscle sound that we, we did, we could estimate how much glycogen is in that tissue. If you're exercising above your VO2 max, it only lasts for a few minutes and then it's gone. Even a 60% VO2 max, it goes down significantly pretty quickly. 30% VO2 max, you can sustain that for a long time because you're not relying on that carbohydrate. As soon as you increase exercise intensity, one of the things that happens is you recruit different muscle fibers. And this is why I'm saying combinations are so much better. How many guys have heard slow twitch, fast twitch muscle fibers? You ever heard that? What does that mean? What is it, what's the difference? Slow twitch is more endurance. Yeah. And so the name just just has to do with what they actually do. Slow twitch muscle fibers, it takes them a longer period of time to generate force in a muscle. Fast twitch do that extremely quickly, and it has to do with the type of enzymes that they have and their overall makeup. How many of you guys think you have more slow twitch than fast twitch muscle? So, <laughs> it's hard to know, right? 
How many of you guys think you have more fast twitch and slow twitch? You know what the percentage is in general? About half. In general, people have about half slow twitch, about half fast twitch. You ever heard that saying, great athletes are born, not made? That's one of the reasons they say that, because genetically we kind of have a predisposition of more fast twitch or slow twitch. Now certain muscles tend to have different composition. For example, gastroc, your large part of your calf, it's mostly fast twitch. Soleus, the muscle that's underneath your calf, is mostly, is mostly slow twitch. Depends on the muscle. Now, if you don't train a certain way, you won't train a specific muscle fiber. And that's what this one says. So this is percentage of muscle fiber recruitment. So in other words, during light intensity exercise, what type of muscle fibers are you using? Type one, slow twitch, that's it. If you increase the intensity of that exercise, you start recruiting type two muscle fibers. In other words, if a person doesn't do high intensity exercise, they're not gonna train half of their muscle. There's a lot of people don't realize that. I've trained quite a few people, and a lot of people will say, yeah, I don't want to do a lot of weights because, you know, I don't want to get big and bulky. And I'll generally say, I'm not going to put you on steroids. It'll be okay. <laughs> okay? So, what that means is, if they just go to the gym and they just walk on the treadmill, they're not burning that many calories, and they're not stimulating fast twitch muscle fiber adaptation. So, they're, they're not optimizing the workout. Now, if part of their workouts are high intensity, part are low, then you're recruiting all of them. And that's basically what the a main point of that is. And as soon as you start recruiting high twitch, the fast twitch muscle fibers, they rely on carbohydrate for energy. So in other words, you want to do high intensity exercise, you're going to recruit these, you got to make sure they have glycogen. Or you won't be able to exercise at high intensity. So how do we maximize? You guys heard of carbo loading? A lot of people think that means I have linguine the night before my run. Okay. Carbo loading is basically a week long protocol. And during that time, that's when you're over that week, you're decreasing physical activity and you're increasing carbohydrate intake. It takes about that long to maximize carbohydrate. Okay. Another way to do it is you consistently eat adequate amounts of carbohydrate as you train and muscle glycogen storage capacity tends to go up. Okay? So yeah, repeated. That, that means don't eat linguine every day. <laughs> That's right. Uh, repeated training can increase muscle glycogen, high carbohydrate intake throughout the day from complex carbohydrate sources. Most calories should come from carbohydrates overall in your diet plan. A better term, and this is probably rather than high carbohydrate, we're gonna say adequate amounts of carbohydrate. All of that needs to be just adjusted for each of you. It, it depends on your physical makeup, your body composition, and your level of training, and whatever you're doing. That amount of carbohydrate needs to be adapted, okay? And some other markers that we'll be looking at. So it's gonna range anywhere from probably 250 to maybe 500 grams. Now, for example, a group of basketball players will have them on 600, 650 grams a day. They need that many. Other sports like softball, baseball, we might drop them to 450, 500. Okay. Carbohydrate has a muscle sparing effect. If you don't eat enough carbohydrate, you can actually kind of lose some muscle because of it. We talked about that yesterday. So, you guys heard that term, glycemic index? It's in the press right now a lot for what Nutrisystem and some of those things they'll say, we use through glycemic index science. It's been around a long time for Dan Marino. Um, but what it means is this. These are foods that stimulate a significant blood glucose response. So after you eat these, your blood glucose will go up significantly, in general, quickly. So things like sports drink, potatoes, certain cereals, crackers, carrots, honey bagels, white bread, and raisins will tend to increase it significantly. That enhances glycogen synthesis by an insulin mechanism. It also provides the glucose for glycogen synthesis. That allows, insulin allows the glucose to go into the muscle cells. And then the insulin promotes protein synthesis in the skeletal muscle. So what types, here's a list here. So this is post-exercise only. You have this chart 
here's higher glycemic index one. Any of those surprise you? Ooh, potatoes, huh? A lot of people think, oh, potatoes, it's complex carb, won't cause a big increase in blood glucose. It can. Medium and lower glycemic index ones are down here. Look at this, low glycemic index, fructose. I don't have fruity pebbles or things like that on here. But <laughs> sugar overall doesn't have a high glycemic index because of the fructose. But obviously, we want to watch sugar intake. So post-exercise, we're here. Rest of the day, down here. So the only time you want to consume high glycemic index food, right after your workout. Rest of the day should be lower glycemic index. So how much? post at practice or ex workout meal, for example. Include about one and a half grams of carbohydrate per kilogram body weight of high glycemic index carbohydrates. That can be a lot of carbs. So for example, about 75 grams might be uh, a number that it ends up being. Should be consumed as soon as possible. So in other words, as soon as you work out, you should be consuming some type of sports drink or something like that. Not after you drive home, not after you make dinner, not after you do that. If you can, maximize it. Stick it in your bag so that right when you're done working, you can start consuming it. Right when you get off your bike or whatever. Protein, you have a little bit longer window. Ideally, you consume it after workout, but high biological pr uh, value protein source with all the essential amino acids, for example, should be low fat, general animal products, approximately 0.5 grams per kilogram body weight as soon as possible. Minimal amount is probably 15 to 25 grams. Most of the research indicates that's a good, a good amount. So larger individuals, closer to 25. Um, protein intake should be consistent since recovery can take a few days. So in other words, every day you kind of want to focus on every one of your meals as a combination of carbohydrate and protein. Try to mix that every time. So building and maintaining muscle. Dietary carbohydrate and protein are the only way to add and maintain muscle. Exercise itself increases muscle breakdown as part of the adaptation process. We talked about that. Carbohydrate and protein reduce muscle breakdown and promote synthesis of protein in the muscle. Okay, so again, we're using our nutrition to change body composition. And overall, that helps with health outcomes. Combination of carbohydrate and protein optimizes the beneficial effects of all of this. Now, the protein and carbs that you intake, would you change that depending like the type of workout versus like I went for a four mile run versus I lifted weights? Would you consume different amounts after the workout or would it be exactly the same? You probably, in general, the more endurance activity you do, the more carbohydrate you should replenish with. Okay, so like for my food plan, I should have a, a preparation plan like saying, hey, after a run, I do this one, but after a uh, high intensity weight training session, I do this training yep. or this set. And I would vary the ratio. In general, the ratio is for the higher intensity stuff, probably about a three to one ratio of carbohydrate to protein. For the longer, more endurance type, you can go up to about five to one carbohydrate to protein. And that's the nice thing about you know having a smooth the smoothie recipes. Let's say you go on a you know a one or two hour bike ride. And you're, and you're into cycling. Well, after that one, I'd say you want to focus on the carbohydrate. So that might be when you do your five to, five to one ratio of carbohydrate to protein. So that might be 100 grams of carbohydrate if your calorie plan allows that, and then 20 grams of protein. Um, and then your other one, your high intensity, would be a three to one. Mm -hmm. And for your pre, you'd also adjust the what you consume right before you work out too? The pre, the most important thing is the carbohydrate. Yep. You don't, it's, it doesn't feel good when you start exercising, your blood glucose is low. Because now what, what happens when you exercise? It goes lower. It'll get to, right? And then when you're, and then if you really want to feel lethargic, don't have carbohydrate after your workout. Maybe just have water. Then after a while, you're like, oh, that thing killed me. Well, you didn't have it before, you didn't have it during, not after, it, it probably does feel terrible, okay? So use that to try to, um, if you're using your nutrition right, I think it's amazing because if you're going through your, uh, your training program, after each of your workouts, after you replenish 
with nutrients, you feel a little bit better. Now your next workout, you're a little bit better. Next workout, a little bit better. If your nutrition's not right, you're going on backwards in a lot of ways, and you're minimizing the results. I mean, I know exercise can be really enjoyable, but you might as well get as much out of it as you can. Um, and nutrition can really help with that. So how much protein and carbohydrate is enough? Here's some details for protein. Bottom line is, when the students are setting up your diets, they're using uh, some of these numbers. And the numbers for protein, we're going to look at grams per day instead of a, more of a percentage of daily calories. Lots of science evidence indicates this. For endurance athletes, we want 1.2 to 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. You guys remember how to go from pounds to kilograms? So take your body weight in pounds divided by 2.2, and then your kilograms. So kilograms always smaller. Another way to remember is 100 kilos is 220 pounds. Okay. So you can do that math, and then you can look at it here, and that's, a lot of times we'll say 1.2 to 1.4. Strength athletes tend to be 1.6 to 1.8. There's no reason to go higher than 2 on this. And a lot of people, when they exercise, they think they need a lot of protein. You do need up to this amount. Above that, you should switch those calories out for, for carbohydrates. Any more than this will provide no benefit. Um, this website is the most thorough and extensive nutrient database. So, and you can get this on your phone. Um, so you can go to this website and let's say, for example, put in Greek yogurt. They'll tell you everything that that Greek yogurt has. There's a lot of stuff on there you'll look at and go, I have no idea what that is, but it's in there. Uh, and that's through the USDA. And that'll tell you how much protein's in there. It'll also tell you what amino acids are in there. How much fat, the type of fat, does it have DHA, does it have EPA? It'll tell you all of that. So that's a good little tool to use. And Nick and Selena are going to send you guys some stuff too, and Delaney will as well, that has like good food sources of certain things and some more detailed information. So you'll get a lot of this, uh, but it's also nice if you uh, start accumulating some of your own details for your own diet. So carbohydrates, you can look at grams per, of carb per day and or percent of daily calories. We kind of do both. Timing and type of carbohydrates important. Should be complex except post-workout. Kind of a ceiling on carbohydrate is about 600 grams is more than enough for almost everybody. You guys will be a lot less than that because we're not in Tour de France or anything like that. Okay, that... And then your carbohydrate and protein examples. So let's say, for example, you're on 2,500 calories a day. If you were at 45% of those of carbohydrates, that's about 280 grams of carbohydrates. Protein, 94 grams of protein would be on a 2,400. But again, we look at it as a percentage, and then we make sure that this number aligns with either that 1.2 or 1.8 calculation. So what does this look like? Over a day, let's say you know in the afternoon you guys are going to go for a long exercise. Three to four hours ahead of time, it's good to have a good mixed meal. So we want probably maybe 100 grams of carbohydrate. Should be complex carbs, and you should have protein. So here's some, not french fries, uh, some good sources of carbohydrate. So it might be maybe some pasta, some bread, some juice. Uh, fruits and vegetables are also good sources. Don't be afraid to eat fruit. Pre-workout snack. So this is right before, ideally, it's carbohydrates and protein. Foods have to be well tolerated, so the athlete needs to experiment. Um, so if you're going to do a, it's a, an important exercise and you, you can't have any problems with your gut, make sure you've tried that food before you start exercising. Because as soon as you start exercising, what happens to blood flow? It, well, what can happen is you start exercising. Let's say you go on a hike. It basically moves away from your central abdomen and moves to the exercising tissue. So what does that mean? Circulation in your guts less than, it, than optimal. 
So your food kind of can feel a little bit different in your gut, and sometimes that's, that can be a problem. So make sure you can tolerate something before you, um, you actually utilize it. So for example, at this point, what are we doing? We're kind of topping off the tank. And we want to try to get blood glucose to start going up before you exercise. So this is right before. This isn't an hour ahead of time. This is a few minutes ahead of time. Mix carbohydrate protein. And you look at some of the uh, examples here. What if, what if you have issues, like usually when, when, you, when you eat, some people have issues with digestion, like they feel it coming up, even if it's just like a, like a little tiny piece of bread or something like that. Is there ways to make that so it's processing better? If I, I would say one option is maybe a sports drink kind of scenario, maybe a juice or something like that that doesn't bother your gut. If you can, yeah. But always make sure you hydrate. Um, that's also an important part of this. We'll talk about that in a second. You get about typically 20, 25% of your fluid for the day comes from food. So when you start modifying food intake, it can affect your hydration status. So you always want to make sure you compensate for that. But if it does bother you in your gut, you got to maybe go, you got to make sure all your other meals are spot on because you're not going to get it right before you start. If you look at this, this is probably what a lot of your diets look like already, but if not, this is what they could. This is a high calorie diet, this is 3,000. You can see breakfast, good mixed meals that everyone on. Good, where's our protein here? It's a little bit in. Can't see those. <laughs> Little bit, yeah. Milk is probably your best protein source here, yeah. So we got some protein here. We got some whole grains here. Whole grains here. Plenty of carbohydrate, right? Carbohydrate here. How about here? Where's our protein? Turkey or meat or whatever. The cheese. Yep. Got milk here. So good mixed meal here. Over here, that looks like a smoothie, right? It's not a mimosa, Palola. We got popcorn here. Over here, another mixed meal. So again, protein and carbohydrate every time. Okay, that's what we should do. What should we avoid? Gotta watch alcohol. It can minimize effects of this. If, I, if I'm in the lab and I'm doing some type of experiment and I want to take water out of my experiment, you can use alcohol to do that. It basically removes water from things. As soon as you consume alcohol, the ethanol is such a small molecule, as soon as it goes into your system, that ethanol can go through cell membranes. So what does it do? It disperses almost immediately. That's why, for example, you say, well, put something in your stomach if you're going to drink something because ethanol will go through your stomach wall and it goes into every cell and as soon as it hits the brain and central nervous system it has obvious effects but when that ethanol goes to the liver it changes everything okay but it'll significantly affect hydration status not just that day but it has a lasting effect on that so it increases your risk of dehydration it also has a diuretic effect what does that mean yeah increases um, urine volume Yep. So it can do that. Pro it can cause problems with body heat regulation. It makes it harder to regulate heat. And so what does that do? A lot of times that increases your perceived rate of exertion during exercise. So you don't train as hard. You don't exercise as hard. As hard. Reduces blood sugar levels. So your energy levels are lower. Impairs muscle glycogen levels. Effects in the body last for days. Decreases absorption or effectiveness of a lot of the nutrients. Impairs your reaction times, coordination and balance, so physical, actual performance is down. Reduces your endurance, strength, and speed. Increases your risk, risk of injury overall. So we want to watch alcohol intake. Fast foods um, are way less than optimal, obviously. If you get in a situation where you have to consume fast foods, then there's certain things that you can consume there to kind of minimize the damage. Uh, that's the better way to look at it instead of, well, it's my only option. I'm going to have that double cheeseburger at, at wherever. So, uh, blank it out. In and out burger. Uh, right? So, junk foods, things including soda, again, too many empty calories, and 
caffeine can blunt your appetite. So now if a person has a soda, then they'll go long periods of time without eating good, nutritious foods and tobacco use. Um, either chewing tobacco or cigarettes uh, can have significant harmful effects. And uh, I understand it's really addicting. Like I played baseball for years and I saw baseball players, they, they can't get off it. And they're on it for long periods of time and they have a lot of health issues because of that. Uh, the chewing tobacco is actually, depending on what kind it is, it's actually more addicting than cigarettes. Um, so that was a, a problem I never, uh, I saw that affect a lot of people. I, I, we had a couple of the guys, one guy, he put it in right before he goes to sleep at night. That's how addicted he was to it. He couldn't sleep without it. He put it in, he'd wake up in the morning, he'd have blood on his pillow sometimes because it had started to wore away so much on his teeth that they were loose and he had kind of some pits and stuff. Uh, and he was a high draft pick. And our nickname for him was Pigpin. He had the worst health habits. It wasn't, he didn't stay in baseball very long and they gave him a lot of money to sign. Uh, but he just couldn't, couldn't, uh, had no discipline and stuff like that. And it was a, it was a, a terrible scenario for his health. Um, so baseball players especially, and things when you're standing around a lot, it's, it's hard to avoid. Golfers, a lot of the golfers use that. A lot of football players use it. Um, and it's, it can be extremely difficult to get off that habit. Um, I don't remember if I have this in here. Uh, another thing that we come across quite a bit is things like Red Bull, Amp, Rockstar, those drinks. They're basically caffeine with stimulants in there and sugar. And that's something that you always have to watch as well. So if we have athletes, I'll say basically, if you need caffeine, have iced tea, have a coffee, have something like that, because at least you're having the caffeine and you know how much is in there and you're minimizing it. Uh, but it's those, those are something that are also can be addicting. So you want to avoid those. And there's lots of uh, calories in there as well. Uh, I remember, and for the college athletes that we work with, you have to watch things. So, well, probably, it's probably been about a year, a year and a half ago now. Uh, in Europe, they do a pretty good job of controlling movement of certain things across borders. And they pulled a shipment of Red Bull and analyzed it. I think it was across a German border. And they found cocaine in there. It gives you wings, right? <laughs> but that's basically what you know those are not very well regulated so they end up with some things in there that they shouldn't that's why even on things like whey protein and health, on supplements like that if you have questions about whether or not that brand is legitimate shoot us the pictures of it and I'll look at it because there's a couple companies right now that are very popular and they're in trouble the FDA is after them because there's stuff in there because the thing about it, if I make a sports supplement and I say adds muscle mass and I know there's lots of competition and as soon as a person gets results, what do they do? They're going to stay on that. It's not uncommon for them to put other stuff in there, like testosterone derivatives and other molecules that add bulk that are very harmful, but the people think, oh, that's some really good whey protein. Uh, not really. So you're going to watch stuff like that. Um, so a little bit about hydration. I don't know if you guys uh, have really looked at this very much, but it's really important. So there's a few different ways to assess hydration status. So here's some ballpark ways of doing it. One way is you weigh yourself before you work out in minimal clothing. Then right before you start, if you're going to go through a, an intense uh, workout, you can say, for example, drink about 20 fluids of, if your calories allow it, maybe a sports drink or a combination of water and a sports drink, and then drink that throughout as well, not just water. If it's going to be a long uh, endurance type exercise, you probably want that additional carbohydrate. Then weigh yourself after the minimal clothing. Refer to the chart to determine your fluid requirements. For example, let's say you do that and you lost a pound of weight during that. You need to replenish with 20 fluid ounces. That's just one pound. If, for example, you lose five pounds, you need about 100 fluid ounces to replenish. And this is over the next few hours. Generally, you want to do that over the next, I think, four to six hours, something like that, period of time. Yeah. 
this work for you and not really just automatically do these work things because they hold so much sugar in them. Because most of them are like 20, 30 grams. It's like already like most of your day for your sugars. You know, you got to get the sodium back up. But if it's over, like if your workout's over an hour, then go for the sport. I'd, I'd, I'd probably say maybe half an hour. It was more than half an hour. And again, you know, they're, they're building this into their nutrition plan. Yeah, so we're assuming you're going to work out. We're assuming that you might need a sports drink. Um, and the, the, some of the electrolytes, the sodium, generally people get enough of that from their diet. Yeah, but some of them do have sugar. But a lot of the times they have a little bit of sugar and they'll have a lot of maltodextrin, which is glucose. So... Uh, I, I t on that one, I tend to stick to the basic. I don't, I don't think there's a problem with Gatorade. Yeah, I prefer that over Powerade. Yeah. Sugar-free ones? Um, depends how long the exercise is, because if you're not, if there's no sugar in there, you're not getting any energy from that. So I'd say for some of them, some of your workouts, that would be fine. But for some of them, you're going you're gonna to want that carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. We're just all used to hearing sugar so bad. But the idea, I guess, is if you plan into your diet, then it's still in the same amount of sugar, you're, you're fine. So as long as you have it planned. It's okay. And when we, say, when we say carbohydrate, I mean uh, not much sugar, mostly carbo other types of carbohydrates. And, and, yeah, I would say too much sugar consumption is, is not a good thing. But carbohydrates, if you're consuming them in an appropriate amount, carbohydrates are okay. But, yeah, we want to try to get it out of the habit of just eating things with sugar if we don't need it. Yeah. How many, like, so these Gatorades, they come in all different sizes. What would you say is, like, a, a good amount? Because we, we, as Americans, we tend to. Mm -hmm. The previous slide was talking about. But like, well, like a full Gatorade, or would you say, like, I don't know how many is it. Depends. Like the little, the ones you typically, let's see, the uh, kind of the larger ones. Yeah. I think they're 32 fluid ounces. Yeah. And that would be, that's probably, how much is in there? Yeah, 21 grams of sugar. Yeah. Yeah. So that's quite a bit there, obviously. So you'd want to make sure that that's, it's not water. Obviously, and a lot of people get in that habit. Oh, I'm thirsty. I'm gonna have a sports drink. It's a sports drink. Rest of your day, you gotta hydrate with water. But if it's post exercise or if it's a targeted use of that carbohydrate, you're fine. But it all adds up. So here's a number. If, for example, at the end of the day, you're 500 calories over what you've burned at the end of that week, you stand a chance of gaining one pound. If each day you shave about 500 calories at the end of that week, you can lose a pound. So if you have one of those and you do that consistently, you got to incorporate and basically think of those calories. Because, uh, yeah, a lot of people uh, don't use those correctly. Okay. I think we kind of went through this. So just to review, consume complex carbohydrates throughout the day, mixed meals, right? Avoid junk food and simple carbohydrates. So again, be conscious of, of what you're doing. Consume nutrient-dense foods to avoid deficiencies of vitamins and minerals and other nutrients. After a workout, maybe 50 to 100 grams of simple carbohydrates immediately and a source of protein. Combination is best there. If possible, consume it. And if possible means if it's a higher intensity workout and is part of your calories for the day, consume a carbohydrate containing drink throughout the workout. Prior to intense training, consume a high quality source of protein as well. Drink fluids throughout the day, not just during workouts. And avoid alcohol consumption. And then anytime you need any nutrition information, ask us. Um, and we are more than happy to, to do that. There's obviously there's a lot of misinformation out there for nutrition. Um, so 
we'll always try to, any information we give you is science-based. Um, and I hear a lot of people say, oh, you people in nutrition change your mind so many times. One week it's good for us, the next week it's not. I'm like, no, I didn't say that. You didn't ask me. Who did you ask? It's just the article that we need. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got a few weeks ago, I scanned a, a, a German guy who's a really good, he's a PhD in uh, some type of technical field. And he's a big triathlete and everything. And he, he basically said that. Because he was talking about his body composition. He go, oh, not that good, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, how's your diet? Oh, I don't worry too much about that because you guys change your minds all the time. I said, so you didn't answer my question. How's your diet? So blah, blah, blah. It was a lot of chocolate, a lot of dark chocolate, and this and that. I'm like, yeah, there you go. Um, no one's ever said that. You know, that your diet's good for you. Um, so it's kind of, there is a lot of information. Obviously, there's a lot of money and a lot of uh, other things that go into this and a lot of factors that affect what people eat. But we always look at the evidence, and that's what's really nice about being part of an academic program. That's what we're supposed to do, and that's what we enjoy. So... Any questions or anything? Yep. Um, so, like, when I'm going to be able to do my workouts, is it going to be pretty much first thing in the morning? Um, would I need to really adjust, like, a pre-workout meal, kind of, like, snack right beforehand that I want to increase the amount of calories I use for that? Because I'm not going to have time to have a meal three hours before I get up and go work out. Right. So, like, a pre-workout snack, would I want to increase everything on that? Or try to, like, afterwards... I would say you definitely want to consume something before you train. I wouldn't, I wouldn't wake up and then train. Um, so get something in you, whether or not it's a smoothie or anything like that. Um, the, no, the amount of calories or food that you can consume um, uh, might be minimal because of your schedule. Some people, when they wake up, they're not that hungry. Um, but if you can, you want to get something, you know, that's going to help you through that workout. When, Overnight, you're, you're, you're using some blood glucose and muscle and, sorry, and liver glycogen is breaking down overnight. So your, your glucose is tend to, it's not going to be as high as it should be before that exercise. Um, and I think that it'll help you through that. Then when you're done is when you might, then obviously you want to have maybe a more significant, substantial meal at that point if you can to replenish. Um, kind of, and you guys have probably heard this don't eat it before you work out in the morning you'll burn more fat yeah I mean, that's just yeah. the I've kind of that. generalized thinking on active duty we get up and train for an hour and a half and then have chow right after that right? yeah it was the daily cycle if you can a little something in your stomach and your gut before you train is, is better try to get that glucose up a little bit and that can help that, that through that workout uh, and even if it's something really quick um, like some of the athletes we work with, I think the baseball team, they one of their groups, they, they start lifting weights at 6 in the morning. And they're in there in the weight room, and they all, some of them were rolling out not having anything, and it's not, it's not optimal. Then it affects your workout, and that's not what you want. Anytime we're exercising, we want to maximize effects. Um, and there are some people who say, oh, you burn more fat if you don't eat before you exercise. What drives fuel sources during exercise is exercise intensity. So if you're going to do intense exercise, you need carbohydrate. And so that's something to think about. And again, if, you, if you're doing higher intensity exercises, you're burning more calories and you might be burning more fat. It's just not as a higher percentage. But the actual amount is probably the same or greater. For those who don't eat any breakfast, um, it's more of a tolerance of like I've heard you say, um, pizza toast with just a few ounces of or GM on it. Or, um,
Yeah, everybody's different. I was talking to two athletes yesterday. One said, 